uh, I got to be elsewhere right now. Okay. So uh, you're just rolling. And As you wish. You hear me? Okay. So, uh, good afternoon. So, um, my name is Cédric Blanchet. I work for a company, European company, uh, called EADS. Well, you might know now in the US following the recent uh, uh, program we got. Um, so, my uh, talk today is about uh, deparametrization. So, um, Deparametrization, it's, um, it's kind of a movement that is going on for like three or four years around. And um, people who are kind of advocating some kind of drastic change in the way we are uh, doing network security. So uh, basically, um, when you look at um, network security through the ages, uh, basically, we haven't changed our way of protecting the network that much. So basically, what we do is uh, we create some uh, networks with uh, boundaries. We put firewalls on the boundaries, and we try to filter what's going in, what's going out. And that's pretty much about it. The only uh, big change we had recently was uh, the um, introduction, well, introduction of this uh, identity-based networking, like we will uh, try to authenticate people who are actually trying to access the network from the layer two. So things that came with uh, Wi-Fi or dot one X on wired network and this kind of thing. But basically, um, everything is all about trying to prevent the bad guys from entering that perimeter. So trying to uh, build some kind of safe environment in which we uh, put every uh, user station and say, well, if you're here, you're safe, so uh, you can do whatever you want. And so basically, this uh, deperimetrization um, tendency wants to uh, break that security model. So what they say, and what I'll try to discuss there, uh, is that basically the network should be open like uh, basically um, remove all the firewalls. Barely, well, not all the firewalls, but most of them. So um, in the end, it means that you will consider the network as hostile all the time. Like you don't, you don't want to trust the network. So you have to take the measures so you can actually survive in this hostile environment. And um, last, they want to put the emphasis, which is very clear in their, um, their statement, on data protection. So instead of saying, I want to protect my box, they say, you want to protect the data you are actually uh, treating on your box. So um, when I first read something about that, it was like quite surprising. I was like, well, they want to get rid of files. This guy must be mad. But basically, that's what makes this approach interesting, is they, they're trying to completely change the, uh, the model, the approach, and uh, it was interesting to see uh, what they want to put in state and trying to uh, get deeper into it. So uh, basically, uh, the presentation is in four steps. So try to see uh, what is uh, essentially the, the, the things behind this uh, deparametrization concept then trying to see um, if it works, like if we can really do it. And uh, well, the answer is uh, not that much. Um, and the, 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 the third part will be trying to uh, see things just a bit differently, and then uh, a conclusion. So basically, deparametrization advocates um, that uh, perimeters, firewalls, and every barrier you put in your network to uh, like prevent the bad guys to get in are just harming your business. So they say uh, perimeters are bad for communication. Like if you want to uh, 
put a new application, then you will have firewalls problem. You have to call the security guys, the network guys, get your authorization, and blah, 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 and so on. But in the end, um, the thing is, your, your firewall uh, just blocking you from doing stuff, from communicating and everything. So users can't access the resources they need. I think you just have to um, just look at the, 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 the roaming problem. So we, when you away from your office and you're trying to fire a VPN to get back to your uh, information system, like the numbers of things you, are, you have to try before finding something that works. It's like, OK, then I will try plain IPsec. OK, that does not work. Maybe I can try NAT traversal. OK, work, maybe, maybe not. So what I can do, um, SSL VPN, yeah, over 80, over 443, using the proxy, everything, everything. So basically, that's a real nightmare. And when we want to uh, cross a step and say, well, now I want to uh, adopt this very trendy fashion that is extended enterprise, like starting to communicate with uh, partners, customers, uh, suppliers, and trying to open your information system to that kind of people, then you got a real problem. In the end, your firewall is just there because you say, well, I put a firewall, but in the end, it's pretty much completely open. And in addition to that, on the, uh, on the other side, well, we, we, we can see that all these firewall we want to protect us are not really doing this. I mean, protocol are getting more and more complex. You have more and more applications that are trying to bypass your firewall by like encapsulating everything in HTTP. And in the end, you just aim to see that your firewall is like, put at the boundary, but it's not preventing anything from happening. And um, if, you, if you look at this, all these buzz around Skype and people trying to prevent Skype from uh, actually working on that network, it's been quite a nightmare for quite a lot of time before people could actually spot the, the, the right way to do it. But in the meantime, people were Skyping all the time from your network, blah, 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 using an API to send network traffic outside, exchanging documents and this kind of thing. That was working. And, um, and the, other way, the other thing is um, Perimeter does not address data security. You, you're putting a barrier, but once a, a flow is authorized through your firewall, then you can put anything inside. So the data itself, you, you, basically you're protecting your infrastructure, you're protecting your boxes, but you're not protecting the data, what, you don't protect the, the, the value of your information system. So basically, um, what they say is, OK, if a firewall is not effective, and if it's blocking me from doing things, why should I keep it? So um, that's what we see now every day. Like, if, you, if you're trying to have firewalls and things like this, so you have this uh, trend about putting everything over HTTP. So now if you look at the protocol that are around, most tools are able to encapsulate anything encrypted over HTTP. I have, an, I have even seen an IPsec client who was actually encapsulating IPsec over HTTP through a proxy with the connect method. That is just crazy. Aside of this, you have more and more complex protocol. And I think SIP is a, a very good example of that. Try, try, just try to put a firewall in the middle of a voice over IP network and see if it works. And if, you, if, you, if your network is big enough, then it just does not scale. So um, at Airbus in France, we have a, a VOIP cluster with 30,000 uh, boxes on the network. If we put a single firewall in the middle of that, nothing is working anymore. It's full Cisco, Cisco firewall, anything not working. I mean, the firewall is not able to keep the pace, to, uh, to treat uh, the bandwidth we have, uh, the number of connections that are open at the same time, just scrolling down. Um, and then you have application while using encryption. So once you're using encryption, your firewall is just blind at understanding what's going on. SIP is a very good example of that. 
when you want to like say put a firewall to protect your um, your call manager so basically you have the signalization coming to your call manager and based on that your firewall will deduce which uh, nodes are talking together and spawn the right authorization for it if you encrypt the signalization then it's over your firewall is not able to read the traffic anymore it's not able to act on the traffic anymore so what you have to do is open the whole UDP range well that's about equal to removing the firewall right so you have encryption uh, you have an application that are using obfuscation like Skype like the botnets we've seen that this morning so when you are facing this kind of application uh, your firewall is pretty new use like using random ports uh, using uh, you, you're not able to spot a pattern that will help you to actually detect and uh, characterize the traffic and then block it and application were doing what we call firewall piercing it's the ability to try many methods to bypass the firewall to establish the connection to the outside would it be uh, bad guys would it be application like, uh, yeah, Skype is very good at firewall piercing, or things like um, the, the Teredo client, this uh, IPv, IPv6 over IPv4 peer-to-peer -peer network. Like you have all series of, uh, of signalization going by, just trying to uh, spot what is the firewall configuration and oh, can I bypass the firewall to establish the communication to the outside. And then you have this thing like everybody is moving all the time. So if you got a network, you will have visitors. So how do you end, how do you end all the fact that some visitors may try to plug into your network? Like entering physically your perimeter. So solutions, bigger firewalls, more bandwidth, more protocols. So uh, if, you, if you look at the, the, the firewall market, it's just growing like hell in terms of uh, bandwidth capabilities, in terms of uh, uh, the number of uh, protocol they can understand and the number of features they add, like antivirus, anti-spam, anti-malware, online, everything, whoa. And so that's the uh, upper part of the stack. And now they actually say, well, uh, that's not sufficient. So you have to go down and down do layer two base security, like authenticate people that are plugging into your network. And then after that, maybe you will be able to consider your perimeter as safe place. Um, something that I could see and is pretty surprising is when you try to actually uh, protect the perimeter too hard, it's like you start to remove application because you consider them as too, uh, too vulnerable to be used, then users um, can show like incredible abilities to find a solution to that. Like, I want to read my email, but I can't access it from remote. No webmail, uh, maybe uh, no working VPN, I don't know what. So what do they do? They register an account online, like Yahoo, like Google Mail, everything, and they forward all their corporate email there. Great. We, we, we had the issue with the BlackBerry as well. It's like, okay, so at some point we said, well, you know, BlackBerry, it's a Canadian product. We are French people. We don't want to use blah, blah. <laughs> you know, the, this kind of stuff, like, you know, we are US. We don't want to use European tanker, this kind of thing. Um, so we banned the BlackBerry for the network. And all these people who were used to use a BlackBerry, what they did is they went to Vodafone, buy a personal BlackBerry, and started to forward their corporate email to their private account. And then it's even worse than before because you don't control anymore the configuration of your BlackBerry setup. So, wow. Um, no shared agenda remotely? Wow, well, Google Calendar is very fine. And you have all these kind of service you can find online, like file sharing, uh, once we even found some documents on a peer-to-peer -peer network because a guy wanted to access his documentation and all these PowerPoint presentation from remote so he actually shared a whole directory on a peer-to-peer -peer network so he could access it from remote 
So basically, it's you know it's this story of uh, too much security, armed security, as you you end up in a situation where your information is just going anywhere, and you don't know where it's going. The only thing you know that it is definitely bad. And in this case, I mean the side effects of what you do to uh, increase your security level. Um, are very difficult to predict. I mean, it's very difficult to uh, actually predict how the random user will react to some kind of measure. And uh, obviously, it's very difficult to, to assess the risk that is linked to it. OK, so uh, that's basically um, the, all the, the statements. And uh, well, what, what we basically can see in the wild of uh, people who are advocating deperimetrization. So they basically they say, well, when, when you have all of that, and you have all these security measures, and uh, they are just uh, blocking the network from actually doing its job, which is enabling people to communicate, um, maybe we should just see things another way. And the other way is to uh, get rid of the firewalls. So that's a pretty big shift. Uh, I mean, we've been doing network security for like 20 years exactly the same way. Now you have people who say, hey, stop, that doesn't work, we change. OK. So um, the main point when you, you read all the papers that are produced by a, um, a thing called the, the Jericho Forum, it's the main group that advocating this kind of approach. And uh, so we got a website. They are uh, producing a lot of papers. It's very interesting to read. And especially there are two of them, the 11 commandments, that actually are saying what you should do, that the, the great ideas you want to implement, and the business case, where they try to explain you that your business is going bad because you got firewall, so you have to remove the firewall to the business to go up. Um, so basically, they, they put the emphasis on data access. So they say everything, the, the value of your IT system in is uh, all the information that is in your system. What? Well, that's an information system, after all. So you have to, uh, the, the, the ultimate thing you have to do is uh, control how people are accessing your information. So basically, what they say is, OK, so um, we, we will consider the network environment as hostile all the time. If you, if you, if you take this approach, then, um, and you manage to do it, then your laptop can be uh, in a hotel, in a Wi-Fi hotspot, in a airport, train station, I don't know where, or in your corporate network, you don't care. It's supposed to be protected. And so you have to secure endpoints, obviously. All the security will be put uh, on the endpoint. Uh, will it be the servers or uh, the clients? And basically, um, the way they they um, the way they want to do it is by moving the security from the network to the applications. So they say basically, well, you have to have a. Uh, an email client that can do uh, TLS and uh, that can authenticate yourself with certificates and this kind of thing. So, um, well, I could say a lot of things about that, but the best way is uh, to, uh, to read that document. So uh, when you got my slides, uh, you can click on that and access it directly. So uh, that's very interesting to read. Um, but after all, when you have read all the documentation and things, and uh, you start to ask questions about, uh, well, that seems a bit too beautiful to be true. I mean, if we could do that, like just think of it for a minute, like take a laptop and just being able to say this laptop, wherever it is, whatever the user behind, it's ultimately secure. There's kind of glitch there. There's something that is wrong. So basically, um, when you look at these 11 commandments, so I, I put the, the, the first five here. So basically, the first one, the scope and level of protection should be specific and appropriate to the asset of risk. Wow, great. I mean, I really needed these commandments to understand that. Security mechanism must be pervasive, simple, scalable, and easy to manage. And the 11 are like this. 
that just, yeah, that's common sense, but that is not explaining me how to do it. I mean, I'm glad I could find a security mechanism that is perfectly simple, scalable, and easy to manage, and efficient, hopefully. So um, last November, I was in Vienna at a conference called DeepSec. So if you, have, uh, if you can come to Europe at this period of time, that's a very good conference. Um, and we had a presentation of the Jericho Forum. And um, the speaker presented like uh, four uh, free success stories and the way his laptop was configured as an example of how to do the parameterization. So basically what he said is, well, I got my laptop. So on my laptop, I got a personal firewall. Uh, so all inbound connections blocked. And uh, basically I can only access uh, some specific services in my company, uh, email, web, this kind of thing. Um, I don't use VPN because they say that VPN sucks, basically. Um, and then, then uh, people started, but how do you do? I mean, if you, if you want your laptop to be uh, self-sufficient, then you have to have an antivirus, a uh, super uh, personal firewall, anti-malware, anti-spam, anti-vat. Uh, for the web browsing, you have to have a, a cleaning software uh, that will put out JavaScript or anything you can find. And it was like, well, actually, no, because all this security stuff is at the company. So basically, the setup of this laptop is instead of having an IPsec link, to the, the main network. So VPN is bad, so they remove the VPN and they have one TLS tunnel by application. So that means that on the other side, uh, uh, on their network, instead of having one VPN gateway, like one open access, they have as many access as they have applications. So um, I don't know you, but my thinking is you dramatically increase your attack surface. And knowing the state of um, cryptographic implementations, and when you look at all the flows on OpenSSL, on uh, cryptographic implementations or uh, most vendors' uh, products, um, I wouldn't like to have, I don't know, maybe five or six SSL stack anywhere in my network. I fairly prefer having like an open BSD IPsec gateway, and uh, there I feel comfortable. Then the, um, the, the, the success story. So be, basically what they say is, uh, well, British, British Petroleum, they, they, they do something really great. They actually put um, 18,000 laptops out of their land. They put them on the internet. So they are self-sufficient. So when they come to the office, in fact, the network at the office is on the internet. OK, so British Petroleum is uh, spanning 18,000 public IP addresses for their internal laptops? Well, actually not. They're on a network behind uh, a network address translation gateway, right? And they're just accessing the internet. So basically, they're behind a firewall. They're inside a perimeter. They're not naked on the internet. So uh, that example is not actually an example of deparameterization. Um, the next one is about the same. They say, well, we have this company. We used to uh, use a central internet access for the whole company, and then they moved to uh, the SL lines. Well, great. So we have a firewall for each DSL line. We have an online anti-spam, online web server, online uh, proxy server, online anti-malware, online I don't know what multiplied by the number of branches they have. So, uh, I mean, the business case is very uh, blurry to me here. And then the last one, I think that's my preferred one. It's KLM who decided to, spend, to uh, save on their uh, support budget. So what they decided to do is to move from the standard corporate supported laptop to users manage laptop. So you're a KLM user then you can buy whatever your laptop you want, and you will be administrator on your laptop, and you will handle the administration of your laptop. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, 
No comment. <laughs> no, but to, to go um, behind this, I mean, these people, they have a laptop you don't know anything about. You don't know anything about the level of security uh, of this box. You don't know if this box is compromised or not. And yet, you will let them access your information. So first, you have the problem of the escalation. I mean, if you got a very bad stuff inside, will it, will it be able to replicate on your network? And uh, will it be able to grab information and send it elsewhere? I mean, you don't know. So I don't, see, I don't really see the benefit. Uh, so maybe they can save, uh, they announce like 2 million euros of support. Great. But I, I don't know how much they actually, uh, they are actually increasing their security level by doing that. So that's why, well, to me, it's not very clear um, if it's deparametrization or not, and if it's working or not. And then if you we, if we, if we want to look at the world, I mean, look at the internet. The IPv4 internet is inherently fragmented. I mean, we're just out of addresses. We have no more addresses, so we have NAT everywhere. And every time you put NAT gateway, you create a perimeter. That's just as simple as this. So this idea of the, the global internet without any firewall, without any barrier, is just not achievable on IPv4, right from the beginning. And the consequence is whether you have to live with those perimeters, whether to, have, uh, to quit IPv4, for the I word, the IPv6, right? Um, and, and when you look at it, it's making the things really difficult when you, you want to uh, just apply what they say. It's like deparametrization in a world that is not globally connected is very, very difficult to achieve, and especially in terms of uh, functionalities. And then you have the scope of it. Like, does it affect the whole IT systems? Like, can you, from one day, well, with a bit of work, and say, now, all my boxes are sufficiently protected so I can put all of them on the internet? Like, your central file server, the server where your ASAP is running with all your financial data with a public IP address? No, basically, it's only affecting mobile resources. I mean, if your resources are not mobile, if they are not roaming all around, there's really no point in changing the way we're doing the things. I mean, if I got a web server, I will put it somewhere behind a firewall. Because if my web server got compromised, I don't want the guy to be able straight away to actually route all the servers behind the SQL server, the application server, and everything. So if you're not mobile, then you just don't care. So that's a very limited scope of um, really the IT systems. So you have the mobile resources and mainly the way they are communicating with the, with the uh, OOM network that will be affected by this kind of, um, of doctrine. So a new solution so far, I mean, what can we do? So um, one efficient solution, um, which is actually used by a lot of application, is what we call uh, overly networking. It's basically what you try to do is trying to create a virtual network over the physical network, where all your nodes can actually communicate freely. So you will have a, pro, uh, a protocol that will encapsulate your communication and then raise them up. So that's how peer-to-peer -peer network are, are working. That's how uh, software like Skype are working. The botnet software we've seen this morning, it's working like this. And it's, uh, it's pretty much, maybe not secure, but it's very resilient. And it's, uh, when, when, when you do it right, it's very powerful. So 
basically what you have to do is find connectivity. Once you want to install your software in a box, the only thing you need is to find a way to reach some gateway that will make you enter the network. So basically when you fire up a, a Skype client, that's what the client is trying to do. Whether reaching a Skype server or reaching a super node, things like that. And once the client is able to do this, then he has access to a far broader network with a lot of functionalities. And then hopefully when you, you, you get into the network, then you can start to communicate. So you can actually do IP over something like Teredo. Teredo is doing IPv6 over a peer-to-peer -peer network. Or you can do what Skype is doing. They have an API. You can write a network application that are using your Skype client to send uh, files or to uh, bring a remote shell, Sox proxy, I don't know, whatever you want. And, uh, and yes. So, um, so in my lab, when we, uh, when we, we, we try to, um, we were working on wireless security and uh, we were trying to find a um, good thing to uh, secure adult networks, like the nightmare. Like a lot of nodes were moving all the time. You don't know who they are and you want to uh, encrypt, authenticate because you don't want anybody to uh, uh, alter the routing of the network. Well, and after some point, we, we went to the same conclusion. It's far more easy and far more secure to actually consider that the network is insecure and that you will take measures on higher uh, levels to ensure the security of your communications. And we did it um, using IPv6. So we said, OK, IPv6, well, good stack. Uh, we got IPsec included, so we will try to do IPsec all the time. And basically, it's working, it's working pretty nice. And, but we end up with the conclusion that if you really want to do things, and like something like deparameterization, which has some, some benefits uh, in the end, you need um, the global connectivity. That means that your network uh, must allow any node to communicate with any other node. So you must be able to find a path in the network to, uh, for one node to reach another, which is actually not the case on the internet. If you guide two guys behind night gateways, you don't have any network path for the two to uh, actually communicate together, unless administrators are doing port redirection or I don't know what mechanism, additionally on top of that. So when you get this kind of uh, communication possible, then you can start to think of what kind of security feature I can put upon that. What kind of nice thing I could develop to make uh, the life of people easier, including overlaid networks. And basically, when you want to um, enter this, uh, this way of thinking, and deparameterization is not actually removing the perimeter, is just creating a perimeter, but differently. So you're creating a cloud, overlaid cloud, and this is your perimeter now. So um, we did our work with IPv6. Wow, many people are doubtful about the ability to IPv6 to actually uh, go uh, in production and uh, to actually work, but um, I mean, we have to face it. Uh, the internet is growing. We are running out addresses. Um, the cost of connectivity is essentially linked to the cost of IP addresses now. So uh, we will uh, end up there sooner or later. So we have to go there. Um, so basically, we have this huge address space that makes everyone have a public address and then global connectivity, blah, 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 no NAT, etc. Um, just just a, a comment that global connectivity does not mean no firewall. It's just the ability if you want to find a path between two points. Now, if you want to put a firewall and say, I don't want this box to be reachable, you can do it. But there's nothing technical that should prevent you to actually communicate with someone, unless you decide not to. 
That's what I mean with uh, global connectivity. And um, one thing we've been trying to um, actually um, study is um, something called mobile IPv6. It's, um, it's just an example of what you can do, actually, if you get global connectivity and this kind of thing that you can't do on a fragmented network. So basically, it's an IPv6 extensions for mobility, <coughs> yeah, like that the name. Um, and um, you should have three things. Like, the first one is when you get a phone, a GSM phone, and you're roaming around the world, you are always reachable on your same phone number. If I want to call you, I always use the same number wherever you are in the world. And so basically, mobile IPv6 want to do the same for IPv6. So you have a fixed address, and wherever you are, whatever your connection mean is, you're always reachable on that very address. So that's the first part. And then, trying to make it completely transparent uh, for applications to the change of medium. Like if you uh, go from a wireless network to a wired network, then you will hopefully uh, change your physical address because you're changing the uh, carrier or everything. And we want uh, our applications to be able to survive that change. Like you're streaming, I don't know what video, uh, maybe you can tolerate two seconds buffering, but in the end you just don't want to restart everything again. And we want it to be secure, right? Because if it's not secure, when we have a problem. And that's pervasive security. Because if you're able to do this, then you don't need to ask yourself, do I have to fire my VPN client or not? Because whatever happens, you're always in the same state uh, against the network. So that's basically the way uh, it's working. So it's, it's a system of tunneling. Um, all your communication is uh, handled by what we call a uh, home agent that is responsible to grabbing the, for grabbing the traffic that is sent to your uh, fixed IP address. And then we send it to your uh, real address, what we call the care of address. So here, uh, down here, we have a, we call the mobile node, the guy that is traveling all the time, and basically keeps updating his situation for the home agent, telling, hello, I'm here, this is my physical address. And then from that point, any node on the network is able to uh, communicate with you directly uh, without knowing, without any uh, supposition on wherever you are, what is your address, anything. Uh, obviously, all this is uh, IPsec protected, because we don't want uh, anybody to be able to spoof your mobile node and then redirect your traffic in the end. So uh, the interesting thing is working pretty well especially now where the uh, IPv6 cloud is pretty much developed. So we have a lot of way to actually encapsulate IPv6 traffic over IPv4. And uh, we're quite a bunch of guys uh, to use that every day on our laptop, and it's working pretty fine. So the next step is to say, well, I don't want all my traffic to go uh, through uh, my home network. I don't want to have my home agent charged with all the traffic that people are sending me. So the uh, next step is to say, well, actually, maybe I can tell directly this uh, node that my address is there and have direct traffic between the two. So that's the kind of feature you can do with, uh, with global connectivity. Uh, you can also have uh, a whole network behind it, and then we call that a mobile router. Like it's carrying its own network with this fixed address range with it. Like, I don't know, a plane in the air that is just able to change medium transparently for applications and just fly whether it is by satellite 
or a WiMAX when it's in approach of the airport, a wireless link on the ground, on an Ethernet cable, just like this, or a mobile phone. You got your mobile phone and you can do Wi-Fi, you can do 3G, uh, you can do uh, Edge or whatever, maybe uh, other kind of connections, USB, and then through the PC access the internet. And then you can change and things are just working. But when we do look at that, um, we're just only dealing with the network security, right? So we're saying, okay, then I can establish an overlay network that is fully encrypted, uh, so I can prevent people from entering my cloud and everything. But still, you have your users, they are browsing the web, they are uh, getting email, reading email, opening attachments, uh, launching uh, attachments, and all the things. Is how do you address all these kind of things? How do you address the data access? How do you address uh, the virus, malware, spam, detection, prevention, uh, response? And that's quite a lot of stuff to do. If you, if you were at that talk uh, yesterday on the uh, antiviruses, like, and you see that antivirus companies are getting like just submerged with all that incredible mass of uh, malware variants all the time. Uh, when, when you look at all this uh, malware that are able to uh, bypass antivirus, personal firewall, etc., etc., there's so many things to do to actually make a system resilient and uh, fully secure by itself. That's something like, wow. That's why I'm pretty doubtful that a random user is able to administrate his box and uh, actually get away with it. So as a conclusion, before uh, stepping to questions, uh, basically, I don't think that the way we're handling network security now with all these firewalls and stacking firewalls and having bigger firewalls all the time will scale, like in the medium term, like, on, like in three or four years. Uh, I don't think that will scale. Because basically, even if you can achieve segregation uh, inside your network, it's more and more difficult to maintain. To maintain for technical reasons, but simply for business reasons. I mean, we are just running globally. We have partners, suppliers. We, we're trying to merge teams together, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not fitting that model. That's not flexible enough to allow this kind of relationship between people. And in the end, and we, we can see that now, um, whatever means we can put in that, uh, we never get what we want. We never get the level of security we want. And we just, at some point, we're just wasting money trying to get that little bit of security that will make 10% of your users starting to use Gmail. So the question is, is the perimeter definitely dead? So my thinking is, well, actually, no. Uh, there are still some applications, some, um, some uh, locations where you need perimeter, definitely, and you can't remove it. But for everything is dealing with uh, external communication, mobility, and everything, won't scale. So the parameterization from everything I've read that it's actually working, it's more like something like re-perimetrization. It's like think the perimeter differently, making more uh, flexible, making more dynamic. So it's more a question of uh, rethinking the very concept of perimeter, and especially um, let the network do its job. I mean, the more we're adding stuff that is blocking network flows, the more we're just arming the network. I mean, we all have that full of story like ADSL link with uh, PPP over Ethernet, uh, MTU problems because on the path someone is filtering ICMP so you can't detect that you have 
uh, a bad MTU on the link and your connection is just stuck. And this kind of thing is happening all the time. Um, global connectivity. I don't know you, but since my laptop is running IPv6, wow. Great. I have no problem whatsoever of connectivity uh, outside the fact that pretty much no website is IPv6 compliant, right? Um, and then use network agnostic security means. It's like um, basically take the assumption that the network is hostile and you can't rely on the network security. If you, if you look at the energy we spend on trying to secure wireless links and the state, the real state of deployed wireless networks, I mean, it's just appalling. If, if, if you uh, take this kind of consideration, then you say, okay, my wireless link is inherently insecure, so I don't use WPA, WPA2, and blah, blah, blah. Just fire a VPN and it's done. And I don't care. Wired, wireless, 3G, I don't care. I have my own network agnostic security uh, feature. And then you can start to enjoy, to enjoy nice feature. But still, wow, that's only the network side. And we have to work on the system side. And there's, wow, quite a bunch of work to do, like uh, virtualization, like, uh, do, uh, should we want to go to a uh, thin clients? Like a client that you could uh, just wipe every time you pour it off? Just booting for a fixed CD-ROM? I don't know what, but there's so many words to say, uh, to do. And, uh, whew. but nobody said that security was an easy stuff. And that's actually make us work and enjoy it. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So, um, if you have questions? No? Yeah. Uh, in your examples of corporations that were doing decriminalization, especially having users on the laptops, do you know if any of those companies thought about issues like discovery or violations of communication privacy laws? In a corporate environment, if they own the hardware, they can monitor anything they want. If they start monitoring things on your own personal hardware, they're wired now. Yeah, actually, I don't know. It was uh, something that we, we tried to discuss during the questions from um, that speaker, but that was very unclear. But it's clear that you have um, uh, a big problem of responsibility. Like if you are, are granting access to your network to a user with some kind of uh, private computer, um, and that computer is compromised, and you have a rebound, and it's compromising your network, I mean, who is responsible for that? Because you granted the access at the, in the first place. So actually, you have to, um, I think they have to, uh, <laughs> to bear the risk of uh, having this kind of problem. But also, the, the corporate information that gets onto that laptop, if the corporation is involved in the legal process and there's a discovery procedure, legally, how do they get the information off the home user's computer? I don't know. That's, I mean, that, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Hopefully, I'm not a lawyer. But, uh, so I, I try to stick to the technical side of the problem. But from the, 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 I mean, all the responsibility, like, the perimeter is, is, uh, is a nice tool as well to say, this is my network, and over this limit, it's not my network anymore. So that's my responsibility, that's not my responsibility anymore. And if you start to uh, remove all the, the, the barriers, where, where is your frontier? Where do you uh, think you are responsible or not? That was a problem um, some company had when people starting to install VPN clients on their personal computers, which is typically the case with what KLM is, uh, is trying to do. Is that at all compatible with the idea of 
Um, yeah, so the, the question was about all this access control and if it was um, compatible with this kind of, um, of thinking. So, um, well, I think that access control would it be authentication or just like trying to verify that the, the, the host is safe? Okay. Yeah, so the verifying the compliance with the security policy. So, uh, well, basically that's, uh, that can be seen from both sides. That as a deparameterization, you can say, well, um, I don't have perimeter, but I want to check that regularly on my laptops are uh, sticking to the, 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 the security policy that uh, the antivirus database is uh, updated, that you have the right level of patch, uh, that you have no additional software installed. But I don't think you have to do it, you necessarily have to do it when you access the network. I mean, you can do it remote with specific clients and this kind of thing. I mean, that's basically what Windows Update is doing from the Windows point of view. And now for the access control, that to me that's merely a way to ensure the perimeter. So it's more on the other side. Um, basically, that's a nice tool if you, if you want to, uh, to um, ensure your perimeter because a side of it is when you can do a small things like uh, allocate VLANs dynamically, so you can have roaming of users within your environment, which is uh, make more your, your network more flexible. But in the end, when you look at the way it's done, there are so many ways to bypass it. That's just incredible. Like the simple one is you look at for the first printer you can find, you unplug the cable, and you spoof the MAC address, and you plug your laptop, and you're done. So um, that's not really a solution. I mean, there's no silver bullet in security. Uh, just uh, you were talking mostly corporate uh, in education. Uh, that's something actually we've been dealing with. Uh, and MIT's model has been deparameterized from the beginning because mm -hmm. our assumption is the hackers are on the inside already. So yeah, know, that's. Um, what? And to give you a, another an answer to what you were saying about how you, you're checking on uh, what's applied to people's laptops and desktops, uh, it does scale it with the right tools. So um, we do have some of that that's being rolled out to check to make sure laptops and desktops are getting the you know uh, patches and or in, being ensured in policy. The other thing is it's not entirely completely deparameterized. More of what we're seeing is we're shrinking the parameters to playpen areas of, okay, this is the financial block, and this is that block, and those areas have their own security policies, and then you can talk to the rest of the network, but the network as a whole is deparameterized. Yeah, that's something we're trying to push as well, and we, we're using in quite some divisions, is using network authentication uh, just to discriminate who is from that division from who is from another division. So if, if, if I go to another division for a project, I don't know what, um, I can still access the, 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 the main corporate network and then access my email, then access my day-to-day -day resources with my VPN. So it's just a way to, uh, it's, in a sense, it's some kind of security, but it just to, it just aim to uh, allow me to access my usual resources and not more. Um, so there's, um, I mean, uh, some kind of trade-off between the deep parameterization, uh, like no more firewalls and uh, the, the fully blocked uh, situation, but when I was a student at the university, I was a network administrator on the, the student network, and uh, so at first I was, uh, wow, we protect the network from the outside, and then at some point, wow, I got to protect the network from the inside as well, <laughs> and I have to protect the outside from the inside. <laughs> Okay, so thank you.